Now, I want you to turn with me this morning in your Bibles. We're turning to Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. And it's to the third chapter this morning, Paul's epistle to the, to the Ephesians. And we're turning to the third chapter, and we're going to turn to a reading where the Lord, by the Holy Spirit, has brought me to, to His message for this morning. Paul's epistle to the Ephesians chapter 3, and come with me please to verse number 13. Now, Paul writes, and this is what he says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. And for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do us exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church, by, Jesus, by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. And we know that the Lord will bless to our hearts this morning the reading of His own precious truth. No matter how hard we try, no matter how hard we try, we cannot hide the fact, we cannot hide the fact there's two sides to every man. There's two sides to all of us. No matter how hard we try and hide it, no matter how hard we try and deny it, there's two sides to us all. There's the attitude, first of all, of the inner man. The inner man. That's the real you, that's the real me the attitude of the inner man. And then there's the appearance of what we call the outer man. There's the true attitude of the inner man, but then there's the outward appearance of the outer man. So many people say, well, what you see is what you get. In many cases, that's not the truth at all, because what you see is, is not really what you get. Because you see, oftentimes the inner man, the real you, the real me, is disguised by the outward man. By the outward man, we hide the true nature of the inward man. So many people are broken inwardly. They hurt inwardly. They're pained inwardly, but that's disguised by what appears to be to be a blessed man, outwardly. A man can be so sad inwardly, yet he appears to be glad outwardly. I was reading a wee article last night. 90% of comedians, 90% of comedians, especially comedians, those people who make us laugh, 
90% of those comedians, they battle with inner depression. Spike Milligan says, the greatest battle I ever had to fight was depression. Robin Williams, depression. David Williams, depression. 90% of the comedians that make us laugh, who seem funny, who seem happy, yet they wrestle with an inner problem. You see, child of God, this morning, sometimes the inner man is often hidden by what we see concerning what we call the outward man. Sometimes the hypocritical inner man, and men use a bit of hypocrisy in all of us. And sometimes the hypocritical inward man is often not seen because all we see is what we appear to be the outward spiritual man. But let's remember this this morning, child of God, God sees the inner man. I was speaking to a lady yesterday. I was in getting my hair cut, and she cuts my hair, and it's getting very far and few between now. But I was in the, and, and she always talks about the things of the Lord. Am I your caller? Always talking about the things of the Lord. That's why my hair is so short, because sometimes I think she forgets that she's cutting my hair, she talks that much. But she shared with me yesterday about a problem that she had. She says, George, I try and live the best I can in my Christian life. But you know, I was taking the, I was taking the hoover out of the cupboard yesterday, and the lid was all tangled. And I was angry with the hoover, and then I felt bad on myself. Well, says I am a listen. Listen. We all struggle at times, even if it's with the hoover. You see, we all, we Sammy Workman, who was a great appeal to me many years ago, used to say this. All you see is we Sammy Workman dancing over the pulpit. He says, go you home and ask his wife, Una, and she'll give you the true report what we Sammy Workman's really like. And it's true with all of us, child of God, this morning. And you know, that has been the case right from the fall. Well, it, all, it happened in the Garden of Eden, how the devil came in disguise. And you know, friend, he came in the disguise of a serpent. In fact, what, the, what Paul said, the Corinthians, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Listen, the devil is the master of all disguises, but listen to me. We can all be the master of our own disguise. Many, many years ago when I worked in Derek Lone's garage, we sold an old Nissan Bluebird, and that's how far back we're going now. We sold this Nissan Bluebird to a young man. Brought her in a number of times to get her serviced, and he and I used to talk over the counter, and there was never any argument with the price. It was wonderful. And this man was one of, this young fellow was one of the nicest persons you could talk to until the 8th of May, 1987. Because on the 8th of May, 1987, that young fellow who I talked with, who seemed so lovely and seemed so friendly, was one of the eight terrorists who were killed at Loch Gaw. You see, there's two sides to every person. But the Lord wants to deal with us this morning concerning the inner man. The inner man which is you, the inner man which is me. Because it's so true what the Lord says. For the Lord saith not as man saith. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but God looketh in the heart. You see, the inner man this morning is the spiritual person of our being. The inner man is the spiritual part of our nature. Sadly, we often forget about the inner man because we're so busy running after the affairs of the outward man. We neglect so easily the inner man because we're so busy running after the pleasures and the needs and the desires of the outer man. And how is it, child of God? Yes, we're so taken up with the needs and with the pleasures and the desires of the outward man that we neglect the inner man. But here's Paul's great plea this morning for God's people. 
And Paul saw the need of these Ephesian believers to get their inner man stabilized, to get their inner man strengthened, to get the spiritual part of them on fire for God. I wonder this morning, child of God, is there an inner passion for God within your bodies and mind? Does the inner man within your, if, does your inner man, my inner man, the real you, the real me, tell me this, have we got a real passion for God? Have we a real passion for Christ? Have we a real passion for His service? Have we a real passion for Him? Never mind anything else. Listen to the Apostle Paul in verse, verse number 16. That he would grant you, he writes, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit. Where? In the inner man. Paul saw a need. And I believe God this morning wants you and I to see the same need. Taking the time out this morning to examine the inner man to examine the spirit you will say to us, to examine that which is the real you and the real me. Paul saw a great need to pray that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit. I can't strengthen your inner man, child of God. It's only the Spirit of God that can strengthen your inner man, and it's only the Spirit of God that can strengthen my inner man. You see, there was a problem in verse 13 because it says, Wherefore I desire that ye faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You see, Paul wants to see the inner man. Listen, God wants to see the inner man strengthened this morning. The inner man strengthened. Never you mind the outward man. Never you mind the outward appearance. Listen, if the inner man is right and if the inward man is correct, I'll tell you then the outward man will be right and the outward man will be perfect. Paul's targeting this morning, God's targeting, targeting through the Apostle Paul, the inner man. Listen, why does Paul plea because, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ. Boys, that's a big one. To know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with the fullness of God. The inner man's passion the inner man's passion for God. First of all, Paul brings before us the root of the inner man's passion. Listen to what he says in the opening words of verse 17. He says, that Christ may dwell in your heart. Do you want to know something this morning? The root of the inner man's passion for God is in Christ. You know, Paul's not pleading for these believers. He's not pleading that the Lord Jesus would come into their hearts. The Lord Jesus is already in their hearts because they're saved. And listen, child of God, the moment you trusted Christ, the moment I trusted Christ, the moment we trusted Christ, Christ came into our hearts. The moment we were saved, that right that very moment, Christ came into our hearts. But that's not what Paul's longing for. That's what not Paul's praying for. They're already saved because Christ has came in. But here's the longing of Paul's heart, that Christ may dwell in your heart. You see, Paul is not, he's not stressing the point about Christ being in these believers. He's stressing the point to the point where Christ feels at home in these believers. When Paul says that Christ may dwell what he really means is that Christ may feel at home and at liberty in your heart. 
that Christ may feel comfortable in your heart. How does that happen? As I have already said, at salvation, Christ takes up permanent residence in your heart. But here's the next thing. But is your heart really his home? Does Christ feel at home in your heart? How do we know this? How does this happen? By giving Christ complete control of your life. Does Christ have complete control of your heart? Does Christ have complete control of your heart, child of God? Does Christ dwell in your heart? Does he dwell in my heart? Does he dwell in our hearts this morning? Does Christ feel comfortable in our heart? When you go to someone's home and you enter through the front door, there are some homes, and I have to say this, every home that I have visited in Kilkeel, all you folks, I have felt at home. And I'm not just saying this. I have felt at home. I've never been as welcomed and so lovingly. I've never been cared for. But you know where I'm coming from. There are some homes down through the many years, and you go into, and I can tell you the last thing you feel is at home. You almost feel unwanted. There's things perhaps in that home that makes you feel uncomfortable. You're present in the home, but you're not comfortable. Last year it was when Tracy and I and a few others, we went over to Uganda there and, and we went to a place called Louise. Louise was a wee island that overlooked Lake Victoria. It was the most beautiful, serenic place on this planet that I have ever visited for beauty. There there's no running water. There's no electric. No nothing. And every morning those school children had to walk a mile and a half and carry a five-gallon drum of water in their head from Lake Victoria, and it was bogging water. You know what I mean when it's bog dirty? But we had to stay in this place for three nights. The men, we stayed in one classroom, and the women, they stayed in the other. And mind you, it's not like the classrooms that you would get at Brackney West, I can assure you. There was about... A dozen men, and we were in one room, and there was a dozen ladies in the other room. And there was these makeshift mattresses and these mosquito nets. And there were two men mosquito nets. And I know most of you know Carl Emerson. Well, Carl Emerson and I, we had to sort of sleep together <laughs> under the one mosquito net. And I can tell you, I can tell you the story because Tracy's up at the crash this morning for if I told you it and her here, she about over them pews like a, like, a, like a rabbit. There were spiders. And they had legs on them like that. That's a fact. And unless we went round every corner, there was no way Tracy and a few others were going to sleep. We got as rid of as many as we could, and then we settled down for the night. And it was this night we couldn't sleep because there was bats flying everywhere. Bats everywhere. And mice. Then there was a second night. I was sound asleep. And Colin, he hit me a dig in the back of the ribs. And we looked up, and all we could see at four o'clock in the morning, it was oh, three o'clock, this torchlight shining through the window. And then all of a sudden, the metal bar on the door started to go. And then ran this colored fellow. And Colin says to me, he says, bro, the Zulus are here. We're going to be massacred, and there's nobody going to know where we are. I can tell you now we stayed there, but I can tell you there's a lot of things in one place that did not make us feel at home. We certainly didn't feel comfortable, I can tell you. I've never seen Colin Emerson as scared in my life. But the wee fellow was one of our helpers, by the way. He thought it was the Zulus. But you know, child of God, this is what the Lord wants to say to us. 
Are there things in your heart that doesn't make Christ feel comfortable being there? Is there in your heart this morning, perhaps maybe my heart, because this message is for me as well as anybody. Is there the spider of an unforgiving spirit? Christ cannot feel at home in your heart if there's an unforgiving spirit there. Is there perhaps bats of unloving spirits because Christ can't feel at home if there's an unloving spirit there? Are there things in my heart, are there things in your heart, are there things in my heart in life that makes Christ feel uncomfortable? That stops Christ from dwelling in our hearts the way he ought to dwell. Oh, he's in our hearts all right. But Paul is stressing to the very point this morning, listen, get the inner man so perfect and strengthened by my Spirit that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Maybe it's a proud spirit. Maybe it's a selfish spirit. Listen, child of God, you know where I'm coming from, don't you? You're in a room, you're in company. And the next thing, there's bad talk, there's bad language, there's dirty jokes. I'll tell you, you don't feel comfortable being there. Sure you don't. I know I don't, I know. Think how Christ must feel if we allow selfish spirits, unloving spirits, unforgiving spirits in our hearts. Think of how Christ feels. Because Christ is the root of the inner man's passion. The challenge that the Lord brought to my heart was this. My house, my body is his temple. Is it his home? Because Christ is the root of the inner man's passion. But look at the reality of the inner man's passion because he says here in verse 17 again that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love. Listen to what Paul doesn't say. Paul doesn't say that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in doctrine. No! Paul doesn't say that ye be rooted and grounded in theology. No! Listen to what Paul says. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye may be, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. I can tell you if there's no roots, there's no fruits. And child of God, the roots of the inner man must be bored down into the depths of love, downward, if there's going to bear fruit upward. That's what Paul means. I remember one time helping a fellow to do a bit of farm work, and I was driving a wee Ford 4000 down into the field. <laughs> and I forgot it was a damp part of the field, and I put too much lock on her, and the next thing I was down to the axles. Down to the axles. Bogged down I was. Well, do you see, this is how we are to be in the love of Christ. Bored down, that the roots of the inner man, bored down, get bogged down into the love of Christ. Because the further the roots go down in any plant, the more stable we are. The further the roots go down into love, not only uh, do we become more stabilized, but we become more mature. Listen to what God is saying to us this morning. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, in love, child of God, not doctrine, not theology, for half of the theology is only codology anyway. 
but that ye being rooted and grounded in love, L-O-V-E, love, because the inner man must find his nourishment from somewhere. And the reality of the inner man's passion is found when his roots are buried deep into the soil of God's love. The inner man, the inner person of you, child of God, the inner person of me, tell me, is our roots this morning, are the roots of the inner person deep into the soil of Christ's love? Because I'll tell you this, if there ever is to be power, if there ever has to be reality, if there's ever going to be power and reality that's going to be outstanding in your life, well then the roots of the inner man needs to be bored down into the soil of Christ's love. The purpose of the roots is to suck up everything, everything for its nourishment and for its good. Oh, child of God, learn, learn from the source of nature this morning how the inner man needs to get the roots, how we need to get our roots into the soil of Christ's love and suck out everything that will be a blessing in our Christian lives. That's what Paul's saying, and that's what God's saying to all of us this morning. The sad reality is there's so many Christians and they're saved for years, but there's no stability and there's no maturity. Paul said in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit. What's the first thing? Love. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, gentleness, long-suffering, Sorry, love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against which there is no law. But for you to bear the fruit of the Spirit, the roots need to be in love, sinking deep into the soil of Christ's love. Do you see the fruit of the Spirit? Look how many branches comes from it. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And it all comes from the soil of love. Put it like this. Joy. That's love singing. Peace. That's love resting. Long-suffering. That's love enduring. Gentleness. That's love's touch. Goodness, that's love's character. Faith, that's love's habit. Meekness, that's love's self-denial. Temperance, temperance, that's love's self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, every branch that comes from it, absorbs its all its nutrients from love. No wonder Paul the Apostle this morning was getting these believers to examine the inner man. No wonder God this week was getting George McConnell to examine the inner man. No wonder God has given me this message this morning so that you and I together will examine the inner man. If we are truly rooted and grounded in love, we would see it right across the board. Here's the whole thing summed up in a nutshell. You and I, there'll be no fruit of the Spirit produced. Are you listening? There will be no fruit of the Spirit produced. No matter what kind of an outward show we put on, 
there'll be no fruit of the Spirit produced. There'll be no evidence of Christ presented from these lives without love. I'm going to finish. Verse 18 and 19, we've got the result of the inner man's passion, that we may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ which path us knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And that's the result of the inner man's passion. Paul, Paul in verse 18 is not declaring four types of love when he talks about the height and the breadth and the length and the depth. Now, what he's really saying, there's four different pictures of love. If we are really rooted in the very love of Christ, he talks about the breadth in verse 18. The breadth means it'll be a love that'll embrace everyone. It talks there about the length. The length is a love that will last forever. It'll go on and on. See, it Spurgeon says, it'll be a love that will last forever. Old age cannot wear it out. Tribulations cannot burn it out. He talks there also about the depth. That means a love that will reach down to every poor sinner, no matter how low. Love will reach down to that person. And then he talks about the height of that love. A love that will seek all sinners for heaven. No matter how well we can disguise the inner man, God sees him. God knows him. But as it was Paul's plea to these believers so this morning, it's God's plea for us to examine the real you, to examine the real me, to examine the inner man this morning, to look at the inner man the real person, the real you, the real me. And if we, if we are to have an inner passion for God and the inner man's passion for Christ, well, then we'd need to examine the root and the reality to gain the result. Because God desires God demands, not me. God demands of all of us that the true character and the true nature and the true person of you and me that we be rooted and grounded in love so that Christ may dwell in our hearts freely. May God bless His Word to our hearts this morning. We're going to sing our closing hymn, 500.